It's every driver's worst fear. An accident he won't walk away from. A young boy is decapitated internally. This child had no possibility of surviving this trauma. A racer loses both legs. He was bleeding to death and we had three minutes. And a teenager is trapped for eight days. I just could feel myself shutting down and that was kind of scary. How do flesh and blood defeat glass and steel? Science solves the mystery of survival against all odds. For a 13-year-old boy, accidents are fun and games. Until virtual reality becomes real. I flew like 10 feet. The bicycle was mangled. I mean, you couldn't even tell it was a bicycle after I got hit. Ricky was what we call a trauma code. He was basically clinically dead on the scene. Phoenix, Arizona. After spending all day with a friend, Ricky Barker is in trouble at home. I had to come home, and I had to get there fast. Because I was running at least maybe 20, 30 minutes late. I don't think it was really wise to do it, but when you're in a hurry, you don't think about that stuff. He is unconscious and turning blue. Call them and tell them where we are, tell them that there's a boy who's hurt. Paramedics arrive in two minutes. Ricky has already stopped breathing. We could not palpate or detect a pulse on him, so in our opinion, Ricky was what we call a trauma code. He was basically clinically dead on the scene. Okay, here we go. All right. Yet they don't give up hope. They try to insert a tube into his airway to give him oxygen. Try an airway? No, go in, stop going in, okay. His internal anatomy was not in the right place. So we presume that Ricky had a pretty substantial neck injury. Carefully, they insert the tube all the way down his windpipe. Okay, here we go. They pump in oxygen and restart okay, his breathing. His heart is beating, but they doubt he'll make it. Really, we did everything we were doing for Ricky, pretty much thinking that maybe some other children can benefit from this horrible tragedy by being able to get his precious organs. And we called him Boy Doe. We just thought that, you know, some parent's going to get the worst phone call of their life. They just told me that he had a broken neck. That's when I knew. I, I mean, I honestly believe that Ricky had been struck and killed. Instead, Ricky faces a living death. When I first met Ricky Barker, I didn't think he was likely to survive. And um, the sadness that I had on meeting him was really at the thought of him surviving. Doctors discover he's internally decapitated. 
the injury was primarily throwing the head severely forward and severing all of the ligaments that attach the cranium to the spine. All that keeps his head in place is skin and a few strands of muscle. You can see a large gap between here and here. The cranium has been pulled off about a half an inch from the top of the spine. When the skull separates from the neck, the underlying neural structures are the spinal cord and the brainstem. You can't breathe and regulate your heart without those structures. So it is uh, actually a very common cause of death in accidents and almost unheard of that someone survives. Ricky's spinal cord is so stretched and bruised, it no longer functions. He's completely paralyzed. He had no function whatsoever in his arms or legs and no ability to breathe. This is the very highest level of spinal cord injury. The outlook normally would mean if the brain is to survive, he will be on a ventilator the rest of his life. It gets worse. Scans show that Ricky's brain is undamaged and functioning normally. If he lives, his mind will be trapped in a paralyzed body. Doctors have a name for this condition, locked-in child. I think it's very difficult for anybody to imagine what it would feel like to be completely physically disconnected from the world and to wake up after the first thing you know, you're, you're riding your bicycle and the next thing you wake up and you're in a very strange surrounding and you can't move. Can you hear me? Ricky, Ricky, can you feel anything? You can't feel your body. In fact, you can't even feel yourself breathing. To take all of that away suddenly must be a truly horrifying experience for anybody. Ricky, can you feel anything? It'll be pretty tough. So what ran through my mind was I had this very active 13-year-old boy who was never going to be able to move, talk, eat, breathe, do anything on his own again. Um, and I just, I couldn't see, honestly, keeping him alive at that point. Even if Ricky's spine recovers, any movement of the head could sever the cord, paralyzing him forever. Yet the family clings to one slim hope. Surgeons believe they can reattach Ricky's skull to his body. The operation is difficult and dangerous but it's Ricky's only chance. Surgeons dissect the torn muscle and tissue on the back of Ricky's neck and expose the bone. Then they reduce the gap between the first vertebrae and the skull. In an operation like that, if you make a mistake, you'll probably lose the patient. After eight hours, surgeons reconnect the skull and spine but the true outcome still lies ahead. For Ricky to recover, signals must start passing along his spinal cord. If they don't, he may be paralyzed for the rest of his life. Doctors have done all they can. The rest is up to Ricky. For his parents, time itself seems paralyzed. We'd have to wait through the operation. Then, then we had to wait to see if there was going to be any movement. And the more time that passed, the less hope we kind of had. For every hour that went by, it, it wasn't good news. I was fully prepared to say to the mother after several days of best efforts, there is no meaningful hope here. This is not right of us to keep pushing. Thirty-six hours after the operation, there's a flicker of hope. When I saw it, I didn't... I thought maybe I was just imagining it. Because you want something so bad, you'll, you know, you start seeing it. Can you hear me? Ricky? Ricky? 
what, what what's going on? Is he hurt? What's why why is he moving? He what's going on here? Hello, he's moving. He's moving. It can mean only one thing. The spinal cord is working again. Messages are passing between Ricky's brain and his body. After three painful months of intensive physical therapy, Ricky regains the use of most of his body. He didn't suddenly start moving. One day he moved his shoulder, another day he moved his arm, the next day he moved his elbow. He, he just, you could see the spinal cord waking up. It was really just an absolutely beautiful thing to see. Ricky recovers through sheer grit. It was actually very tough for me because I knew before the accident I could do all this stuff. It just kept upsetting me more and more that I couldn't do it at the time. Grit triumphs. Ten weeks after he was split in two, Ricky goes home. Maybe my son will have a chance to, to live a full life like he's supposed to. That he can bury his mom instead of his mom burying him. Ricky Barker survived a minefield. One false step would have killed him. Science shows how he escaped. An accident leaves Ricky Barker internally decapitated. Yet he lives to be put back together. Science reveals how he survived. It starts with good Samaritans. They mean well. But their good intentions could backfire. Ricky's skull is detached from his neck. The slightest movement could sever his spinal cord with disastrous consequences. What happened? The woman knows what not to do. Okay, okay. The first key to Ricky's survival. The next, quick help. Damage to his spinal cord prevents messages passing from Ricky's brain to his body. As a result, he stopped breathing. Hey, buddy. Restoring oxygen is the third key to his survival. Carefully supplying it is the fourth. It's not going. He looked externally at his anatomy, it looked normal. But from the inside, it looked abnormal because his vocal cords were very low in his throat, which identified that his anatomy was just not in the right place. You got her? Paramedics steer the tube down his distorted airway without further damage to his spinal cord. Grab the stretcher, please. Officer, go grab the stretcher. Somebody go grab the stretcher, Bring please. The stretcher over. Now they can pump oxygen into his lungs. Okay, okay, buddy. He pinked up like that. The fifth key, safe transportation. Paramedics carefully hold his head. Placing Ricky in a neck collar would risk more damage to his spine. The sixth key is the location of the accident. In a city big enough to have a speciality hospital. Phoenix Children's Hospital has one of the best pediatric neurosurgery units in the southwest. Finally, a daring operation. First, doctors reduce the gap between the skull and the spinal column. Next, they insert titanium screws into Ricky's skull and vertebrae. Rods link the screws, then the screws are tightened. The screws are going within millimeters of arteries that go to the brain stem, so you can cause a stroke by um, being very slightly off on a screw. The skull and spinal column are reconnected. The spinal cord returns to its normal size. Millions of neurons slowly recover. Signals begin to pass along the body's information highway. The chances of a full recovery from a severe spinal cord injury are less than 10%.
What the surgeons did is like repairing a broken bridge and waiting for traffic to cross. But it seldom resumes at its former volume. Often, not at all. And no one can predict the outcome. Medicine is still grappling to master the nervous system. Ricky's spinal cord healed completely, but two injuries remain. Nerve damage left one arm completely paralyzed and only one lung is working. At night, he needs a ventilator to help him breathe. Titanium rods and screws still keep his head attached. At 18, he has a level-headed outlook on life. Every human has that genetic code implanted in their genes as a will to live. I think that's what forced me to survive. Ricky survived a hit at 64 kilometers per hour. Alex Zanardi was struck at nearly 320 kilometers per hour. Alex Zanardi is addicted to speed. Everybody's DNA, there is something that, that drives us to be very passionate for something in life. I like the roar of the race car and to sniff the fume of the engine, to feel the grip of the tire. It is something that winds me up, definitely. Alex is known as a daredevil. Alex Zanardi at the top of the hill turn, and he gets him! Unbelievable! He's won legions of fans and two world championships. In 2001, Alex is having a poor season. In the 16th race of the year, he starts at the back of the field, 22nd out of 27. And look for a green flag. Green, green, green. Alex Zanardi is now working on Michael. Two former series champions, they go wheel to wheel. And side by side, Zanardi goes past. The Daredevil is back. Zanardi, Zanardi, right past Rex. Midway through the race, Alex has battled into third. I was enjoying myself a lot because um, uh, for the first time in the year, I, I felt the car responding to my inputs. Zanardi inside of Carpentier, Zanardi to second. Morris, none cars run first. 141 laps down. With 13 to go, Alex is in the lead. He makes a final pit stop. The advantage I had prior to the pit stop uh, is pure mathematic. I was gonna regain the lead and, and win the race. Chief mechanic waved me by and said, go, go, go. Eric, nice, nice stop. It was 5.3 seconds on my clock. from the pit lane, Alex will merge onto the track. But he loses control and skids onto the circuit into harm's way. I'm spinning and I can see my hands desperately uh, reaching the steering wheel to try to control the car. The impact happens at nearly 320 kilometers an hour most devastating crash I've ever seen, without question. Rescuers arrive in 19 seconds. The first doctor is Terry Trammell. You know what you see, but you don't want to believe it. The first thing I did was promptly slip and fall onto my hands and knees I thought I slipped and fell in oil from, from the car as I approached the car, but it was blood. Only the worst kind of trauma could produce so much bleeding. It's the kind of injury that not only ends a driver's career, but also his life. 
both legs are gone. Disintegrated and spread all over the track. A very ugly, traumatic thing to see. And Alex was sitting, still sitting in the cockpit of the uh, race car. He was bleeding to death, and we had three minutes. Uh, and we'd already used up probably 20 seconds of that three minutes getting there. Trammell treats the right stump first. So I just took a big wad of dressings and stuck it in the, the, the skin sleeve and folded it back underneath his uh, thigh, and it pretty well stopped. But the left leg is still gushing. So I asked the guy next to me, I said, I really need a tourniquet. He undid his uh, belt that had his radio and stuff on it, and we used that as a tourniquet. And that, as long as we could keep, keep it drawn up tight, uh, it worked fairly well. Paramedics ensure Alex's airway is clear and immobilize his neck. Now they can move him. In the ambulance, Alex's condition gets worse. His blood pressure is faint, his oxygen level is low, and his heartbeat is dangerously erratic. I was shocked. Uh, his uh, eyes, who were always blue and bright, sparkling, were gray and sunken. Uh, he looked like a dying man. Medics give Alex oxygen to breathe and a saline drip to increase his blood pressure. It buys Alex time. But what he needs most is blood. Without it, his heart, kidneys, and brain will start to die within the hour. The nearest trauma center that can treat this kind of emergency is 160 kilometers away. Alex begins the race of his life. When the helicopter left with Alex, I remember a, a sudden feeling of just total emptiness, as if the world has just stopped. And that's the hardest time. You've done everything you can do, and all you can do is sit and wait. Fifty-nine minutes have passed since the crash. He's lost more than three quarters of his blood. My heart was pumping, nothing more than plasma and air probably, I don't know what else. And when the emergency physician uh, in Berlin told me that the helicopter had arrived and that Alex was in the operating room, big cheer went up and uh, we knew it was still a major battle, but uh, at least he had arrived and uh, there was, there was a chance now. For three days, Alex lies in a coma. When he comes to, his wife breaks the news. My first question was, hmm, I wonder how the hell I'm going to do all the things that I have to do now with no legs. But like, I had no doubt in my mind that I was going to do it. For Alex, the incident is a dim and distant memory. But it still haunts his rescuers. It never goes away. The images are always there. The worst part of anybody's day is, is the 20 minutes before you go to sleep. That's when you relive the images. You can smell and feel the blood and, and the, the, the fear that you suppressed. Um, and you don't sleep real well. Less than a year later, Alex is back on his feet. Equipped with prosthetic legs, he pays his respects to the men who saved his life. 
I went to Toronto to watch the race and I saw Terry Tremor was the one that first arrived on the scene and in his eyes I read everything that went through in these terrible circumstances. I said to Terry, Terry, you want to see my legs, how they healed up? And he said, yeah, okay. And I took my prosthetic legs off and he looked at me and he looked at me smiling in good health like this. And he kind of almost collapsed, like he sat down like this and he looked at me and he said, no, Alex, what? For the first time tonight, I'm going to start to sleep again. When I saw how well he was doing with it, Suddenly, everything was okay. Uh, you know, he, Alex was gonna uh, be fine. The next question only science can answer. How did Alex survive one of racing's worst accidents? Alex Zanardi loses both legs in a horrific collision, but lives. For most drivers, a 320 kilometer an hour crash should be unsurvivable. Crash testings show impacts at that speed can exert a fatal force on the driver. The body is strapped in, but the organs are still moving. The liver and kidneys burst. The heart rips from the aorta. The neck can snap, and the brain smashes against the skull. G-forces are a measure of the body's acceleration. Pilots can withstand 10 Gs before blacking out. The human body can survive about 45 Gs. Crashing into a wall at 320 kilometers per hour would exert more than 100 Gs. What saved Alex was the design of his car. To protect drivers, the nose cone is strengthened with layers of reinforced carbon fiber. Other areas are weaker, like the section of chassis for the legs. When Alex spins onto the track, he exposes the most vulnerable part of his car. At 320 kilometers an hour, the toughened nose cone slices through the chassis like a knife through warm butter. With so little resistance, the force of the impact is actually minimized. The first key to Alex's survival. The second is receiving instant help. Within seconds, the safety team reduces the bleeding. Yet Alex has lost so much blood, his heartbeat is irregular. He could arrest at any moment. Doctors give him a weak solution of salt and water with the same percentage of salt as human blood. The saline solution increases the volume of fluid in his bloodstream and helps transport vital red blood cells around his body. The solution stabilizes Alex's heart and buys precious time the third key to his survival. The fourth, ironically, is speed. 24 minutes after the accident, Alex is on his way to the hospital. The trip takes 35 minutes within the narrow window of life. His heart stops seven times. But each time, paramedics restart it. Within one hour of the crash, he gets life-saving transfusions. Alex starts a new race, a lightning recovery that astounds his doctors. After six weeks, he leaves hospital. Two years later, he makes a comeback on the same track where he nearly died. In a specially adapted car, he drives the 13 laps he never finished. 
uh, we all cried a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> Alex uh, was teary-eyed. Huge cheer when he got the checker flag, and uh, that's when we all knew that Alex was really back. Um, the same strong guy that I was before, carrying my son over my shoulder, playing in the pool with him, kissing my wife in the night, and drive my race car to the best of my ability. Both Alex Zanardi and Ricky Barker are alive because help arrived in seconds. But imagine being trapped and lost for eight days. Aldergrove, near Vancouver, Canada. Joe Spring is a 19-year-old art student heading to Prince Rupert for a friend's graduation. The trip will take Joe almost 1,500 kilometers across some of the wildest country in Canada. I thought I can do it. It's 24 hours, no problem, you know? Joe is so excited, he hasn't slept for two days. And everybody at work told him that he should sleep. And we told him he should leave in the morning. It's not going to really cost him that much more time. So, told me think about it. I thought about it for about two seconds. After three hours, he's still determined to keep driving. Then I started to get tired. As Joe gets sleepier, he starts to drive faster. Put it in cruise control. Now I don't have to worry about the gas pedal no more. Uh, <laughs> stupid. If you ever been tired and you blink your eye, the, the gap between opening was getting longer. <laughs> Days later, he comes to. I didn't think I was in a car accident or anything like that. I, I, my brain's not working properly. I can't put it together. All I can think of is that I can hear cars. Joe has a concussion. Fractured cheekbones make it hard to see. After two days, Joe's parents are worried. Uh, I was expecting by Tuesday night to get a call, OK, I'm here, and then we could relax. And the call didn't come. By day three, there is still no word from Joe. You start to wonder, you know, what, what was actually going on. On day four, Police launch a search. They have over 1,550 square kilometers to cover. Joe is famished. Super hungry, I don't know how to describe it. The growling stomach, um, starting to feel weak. But the real threat is dehydration. He has water, but he can't reach it. So I got really, really thirsty, so I guess drinking my saliva was all I could do, you know? By day five, there's still no sign of Joe. Now his family joins the search. I felt like if it's your child that's missing, you've got to do what you can. There were dips, there were cliffs, there were where we would stop and we would kind of drive and, and look down and see if we saw broken trees or vehicles or just anything. And there were a lot of those. And there was water. The water really gave us the creeps. So we thought he could have gone off in there and be under there. 
Day 7. Time becomes the enemy of hope. Nobody had heard anything. It was just kind of despair that we had not heard anything. I was thinking, how much longer is this going to go on? You know, there comes a point we've got to stop. Joe loses hope, too. I wasn't scared until there was like a point that my, I felt my eyes closing and I just could feel myself shutting down. And that was kind of scary. Day eight. While Joe's parents keep looking, police expand their search. Their focus is Highway 97. And I've done that drive many times myself, and I thought, where do I get tired? Because it was an overnight drive. Where, do I, where did I get tired? And I always got tired at uh, just past Williams Lake. Just past Williams Lake, something catches the eye. So I spotted two bears in a clearing along the side of the highway. We slowed and hovered. As Jodine tipped the aircraft forward, and she said, oh, there he is. And I took a look, and sure enough, in between the, the tall pines was a red car. No one expects to find Joe alive. I was scanning the area looking for a body. As I approached the vehicle, I saw an, someone sitting in the driver's seat with an, his left arm up over his head. It looked to me like a dead body. The arm was at an unnatural angle. As I approached a little bit more, all of a sudden I saw the arm wave. And I realized that uh, he was alive. Honestly, I didn't know what was going on. Maybe I was dreaming. I was about to wake up, and this had been one really, really awful dream, you know? Joe. Joe. He was dusty, emaciated, gaunt, um, face bloodied, uh, eyes swollen shut. He was at the end of his rope. As Joe is rushed to hospital, his parents learn their son is alive. It was like a big load lifted off of you. Your heart just flops. Whatever it is from here, he's alive right now, and it's over. But not for Joe. He's lost nearly 19 kilos. His appearance was that of a prune. Uh, he was dried out. And that is something soldiers saw in the Second World War and the people who were in the concentration camps. Once you lose a lot of weight, um, it's not that you're just a thin individual. It's that the whole, your whole skin starts to hang on you. Weight loss isn't the biggest concern. His lungs are leaking and near collapse. His cheeks and jawbone are fractured. His broken ankle is badly deformed. But he'll live. The doctor's first worry isn't the broken bones. Dehydration has created a dangerous chemical imbalance. There was a serious risk to his life when he arrived, not from his injuries, but from the dehydration. Dehydration plays havoc with Joe's mind. Abnormally high levels of sodium distort his thinking. So does the concussion. The combination causes Joe to hallucinate. Joe! 
Hey Joe. Joe. Hey Joe. Hey, wake up, Joe. Among the witnesses is his best friend, Tom. Hey Joe. Tom was by my bed and he said to me, um, if you can hear me, if you ever know I'm here, like squeeze my hand, right? And he had was holding my hand. I thought I got up and I was like shaking him because I was like squeezing him for everything I was. It never happened. It's all in Joe's mind. I think I felt the move. And then uh, he said to my mom that I think I felt something. I imagined everything looking back. As far as I knew, I was yelling, I was sitting up. Adam, I'm here, I'm here, okay, finish this dream, wake me up, whatever, is yelling. And then they all started to walk out the room and close the door on me. Almost like if I was in heaven and I was looking back and it's just a joke or something, I don't know, but it put me right back into a coma when they closed that door. It takes two weeks for reality to return. The story of how he survived is an epic tale to match his journey. The very conditions that confounded searchers for so long proved key to his survival. Joe Spring was trapped in the wreckage of his car for eight days. Science reveals how he survived. Joe had no food in the car. Yet all the time, he was getting nourishment. Without food, the body feeds on itself. It consumes surplus fat and turns it into calories. Then it starts to break down muscle for sugars and water. Fitness is crucial. A muscular body can better withstand malnutrition and dehydration. Joe has a well-developed body. He could live off his muscle for weeks, the first key to his survival. Some people have survived a month or even close to two months without feeding. Water is another matter. I could only imagine what he felt, water being so close and yet so far. The body uses more than two litres of water each day. Joe loses around half a litre a day just by breathing. Still more in sweat, urine and blood. Without water, his skin will shrivel, his muscles will malfunction, and he'll go blind. Few people survive more than three days without water. Joe's survival depends on how well his body can retain it. The surroundings that hide him also save him. Shelter from the sun keeps him cool and reduces sweating. The air beneath the trees is also more humid and thus less dry. Trees are the second key to Joe's survival. The third is the cold. At night, temperatures drop to around five degrees Celsius. Joe becomes mildly hypothermic. His metabolism slows down, so his body needs less oxygen. Less oxygen means less breathing. His body retains more water. His kidneys also conserve water by reducing the amount he urinates. But this conservation creates danger a build-up of toxic waste. 
The toxins keep blood from supplying the kidneys with oxygen. Cells begin to die. There comes a point when the kidneys cannot compensate any longer, and then they begin to shut down. The last key to Joe's survival is a timely rescue. Hours from death, help arrives. Today, Joe lives with only one side effect. The concussion he sustained left his head especially vulnerable to injury. He still trains, but he no longer competes in the sport he loves. Sheer youth and his fitness and his uh, uh, resiliency uh, enabled him to survive this event uh, and uh, make a good recovery. In a crash, two kinds of machine collide. One made of steel, the other of bone. While one is destroyed beyond repair, the other may be rebuilt, so strong is the will to survive. There's just something inside that wasn't gonna give up. I think the reason I survived was because I had a big, a big determination and will. For some reason I'm here, against all odds.